still in shock over Aaron Rodgers. I'm sorry. Still in shock over Aaron Rodgers. Yeah, it's a lot of. Uh, can't have anything nice. Well, <laughs> I, we, yeah, I don't know what to say about that. I've got. Yeah, a, I'm a. I, it's I'm a Mets and a Jets fan. So, okay. yeah, I'm I'm pretty screwed on both fronts. Yeah, uh, good times. I've got a buddy who's got the name Jets in his email address, so I yeah. wrote him in. Um, I told him uh, he's welcome to join my team, which is, or, which who are the 49ers. Oh, you're a Niners fan, yeah, that's right. My wife's a Niners fan too. Yes, who is led? Well, yeah, of course. He's, well, she had to make a choice. My sister chose the Raiders, but um, yeah, but it's led by the. Mr. Irrelevant, the last person chosen in the draft. He's under. I think he's good. And he's playing his butt off. <laughs> I think he's good. I like him. I would I would take him over uh Zach Wilson any day of the week. Yeah, Zach Zach's a he's a he's a work in progress. I'll just say that. <laughs> uh, I I can't. I'm for my mental health, I don't think I'm gonna do it for the rest of the year. I did the same thing for the Mets. Yeah. Yeah. I I I, I um I uh, injured my uh, Achilles when I was running track in high school, and I was done for one entire year. So I know how oh, bad it's brutal. that is. Yeah. yeah, I I knew exactly what happened. Like when it happened, I was like, he blew out his Achilles. My wife's like, oh no, be positive. I'm like, nah, it's over. Yeah, yeah, it was bad. Well, t t tell your wife. Um, I, I hope she enjoyed the game this past weekend, the Niners, because um, yeah, yeah, she did. Yeah. Matter of fact, their their um backup quarterback is another um, high pick round high round pick and um you know oh uh, so Trey, uh, Trey Buffalo's Lance got, yeah Buffalo's got problems too so yeah looks like it yeah. but yeah I'm not gonna do it for the year it's a shame too I was so hyped up like you know it was on nine eleven guy comes running out on the I didn't want to do it to myself all year like I didn't want to get excited and then he comes running out on the field with that flag and I'm like oh yeah. <laughs> Let's go. And then four plays in. Uh, terrible. Well, the O-line didn't protect him. He got sacked right away from the front side. At all. Got sacked on the back side. So it's. At all. That I, if they got to fire that left tackle. He's terrible. Yeah. Oh. I mean, the guy dropped to the ground. Anyway. It was um, bad. So anyway, so let's get started because we have a lot to cover and uh, it's, um, we're going to finish out chapter two today, and then I'm going to sure. fire up the homework on this one. Uh, so there's 16 here. Hopefully the rest of the class shows up. Um, so anyway, um, th there was I sent out an announcement with a number of uh, things on the uh, – see if I can get – pull this up. Yeah, so I sent out an announcement with um, a number of things to do, which was to – uh, there's two parts on discussion board um, because there's the video case on um, Harvard, which talks about utilitarianism, consequentialism, and ethics. Then there was the uh, Enron case, um, which is a, a pure ethics case. Uh, and if you um, look through, uh, I talked about this on Monday, the chapter two folder, you see there was a lot of... Um, uh, things that I placed here, I didn't expect you to look at all of it. Some of it um, basically reinforced the same point, but um, ho hopefully you're able to look at a number of those pieces that kind of speaks to um, the issues of, and remember this chapter is on ethics, uh, and there's a lot of different ways that you can look at ethics. And then there are some things that I asked you to, to do to prepare for today's class. Um, you know, starting here is just prepared to discuss and explain the meaning in class of the following. And so I listed out some of these things here. So um, I want to cover these um, points um, and I don't want to play a lot of these videos because they'll take up most of the class time. Um, I did want to share um, a video and um, ask you uh, in what way does this apply to the class? And then um, let's see, I had two of them. Let's see if I can figure out where I put them. Yeah, there's this one. Yeah, okay. So the first one is the triangle. Um, 
shirtwaist fact uh, factory fire. So I'm gonna play this. It's only um, three minutes and change. And then I want you to explain to me what happened in, in summary, but then explain to me how um, morals are applied here and how ethics are applied here or not, All right? So let me open this up. You should be able to see this. If you can't hear it, just chime in right away so that I can stop it and figure out what I'm not doing right and get it to work properly. Let me use here. All right, okay, so here we go. The Triangle Shirtwaist Factory Can you hear this? was a man-made disaster, yep. a tragedy okay. of the industrial age, made all the worse because it could have been prevented. Let me set the scene. New York City, early 20th century. The Triangle Shirtwaist Factory occupied several floors of a Manhattan business building called the Ash Building. It was located just off Washington Square Park, one of the wealthiest neighborhoods in the city. The Triangle Shirtwaist Factory was, by almost any definition, a sweatshop. It was a densely packed place. Some 500 people worked there. And the work schedule was punishing. 11 to 12 hours a day, every day. Most of the people employed at the factory were young immigrant women, teenagers even, who didn't speak English. These women sat at long tables, day in, day out, sewing shirtwaists. Shirtwaists were mass-produced blouses. They resembled men's shirts and were very popular with working women. So here's what happened. March 25th, 1911, Saturday evening, the end of the workday, the work week. A fire started in a bin of cotton scraps, perhaps from a cigarette butt. A manager tried to use a hose to put it out, but the hose valve was rusted shut and the hose itself was rotted away. The factory floor didn't have a sprinkler system, so the fire spread quickly. People panicked. The building had only one flimsy fire escape, and it wasn't nearly big enough. It collapsed. The building had four elevators, but only one was working, and it only held 12 people at a time. It managed to make four rescue trips before it broke down. Some desperate workers jumped to their deaths down the elevator shaft. Workers yeah. tried to take the stairs, but the exit doors only opened inward, and they were kept locked by factory management. Many people were crushed to death trying to get out. Firefighting technology hadn't caught up to the new tall buildings of a city like New York. The fire hoses and ladders could only reach the seventh floor, one floor short of the fire. Dozens of desperate workers jumped out of the windows. They chose to die from the fall instead of the flames. Other workers burned to death or died from smoke inhalation. The whole episode lasted just 18 minutes. 144 people were dead. Two more died later in the hospital bringing the death toll to 146. Until the events of September 11th, it was the deadliest workplace disaster in New York City history. Days later, on April 5th, a massive funeral protest march took place on Fifth Avenue in Manhattan. More than 350,000 people were in attendance. The factory owners, Max Blanc and Isaac Harris, were indicted for manslaughter, but were declared not guilty in their trial later that year. Yet. Long after the flames died out, the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory fire served as a cautionary tale that helped to redefine the American industrial workplace. The fire was a key moment in the growth of labor unions, particularly the ILGWU, or International Ladies' Garment Workers' Union. New York City passed measures including the Sullivan Hoey Fire Prevention Law, which required sprinkler systems to be installed in all factories. It served as a model for state and national workplace safety codes. These measures made American workers safer, but they were too late for the workers who perished one terrible March day at the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory. Okay, so... Getting elected president is an expensive business. Okay, so the question is, um, how is this uh, a moral or an ethical issue? Or is it? The It would be both, right? I want you to tell me. Um, yeah, it's 100% both. Because, like, morally, you know, you have all these people working in these horribly adverse conditions. Um, and ethically, like, there, there's no means of escape. There's no, uh, there's no, like, possible egress these people could have taken in, like, worst case scenario. So, 
I mean, there's there's probably more, but definitely both. Okay. Anyone else want to um, say what, what their thoughts are on this based on what we've learned so far in this chapter? I also think it's a moral and ethical, like, uh, I say fallacy, I guess, because, like, that really could have been prevented with proper safety precautions and maybe 100%. a little bit more careful study of the workplace. Like, you really welded shut a sprinkler, bro? Like, that's that's pretty illegal. Yeah. Okay, anyone else? Because you just uh, used a term that I think we need to focus on. Anyone else? Um, I, I said, um, I think it's more uh, towards, like, ethical because as a result, like, um, there was a, there was change in business conduct and, like, policies and in terms of them equipment, um, businesses with sprinklers uh and in the story there wasn't a stabilized escape route in terms of a fire escape so i feel like it flows more towards ethics in the workplace and protecting the workers okay so let's throw in the point that they were indicted but they were found not guilty yeah. So how does that play into whether this is a moral issue and or an ethical issue? Uh, I think they were found not guilty because, you know, you could probably let them pass with like, I don't know, maybe it was an accident on their part where you could probably say, the proper safety precautions weren't really available, so they probably wouldn't get indicted on that based on those two reasons. So um, I think it was you, Harlan, you actually used the word illegal. And so if you remember, we can we have policies and policies um, can be in some cases federal, especially when you cross state lines. But because we are a republic as a country, the states have control of, of um of what you what what policies they have at the state level, but then those policies have to be ruled on or voted on by the Congress, whether it's at the federal level or at the state level, to become law. And then law becomes what you legally illegally can't do or have to do. Um, and so when you talk about no access to a way to get out, um, the um, the fire hose um, rusted shut and the hose itself rotted out. Um, locks placed on the doors because back then they were more concerned about people stealing. Um, those doors were meant to keep um, workers from taking things and running down the stairwell. Um, their concern wasn't that they would get stuck. So they were more concerned about people stealing and running out this door, um, those lo locations instead of the other way around. And then, of course, the elevators eventually malfunctioned. Um, and then on the other side, um, because remember the fire department, which was created by Benjamin Franklin, uh, came out of the nonprofit sector. Um, they weren't designed to get to, they, they could only go to seven floors and the fire started on the eighth floor. Um, and so th when they were indicted, they were indicted uh, over the possibility that they did something wrong. And then when um, they were brought to trial, that, um, in the end, they morally did something that was unconscionable but ethically, which we learned on Monday, is about right and wrong and about rules like code of ethics, is that they didn't break any rules. Um, and so then the, the city and state of New York had to change um, how they design um, fire trucks and any other kind of precautions to actually protect um, people in buildings as well as buildings. And I want to talk about that in a second also. Um, and then... Sure putting sprinklers in and, you know, opening up the, the egress for people to actually be able uh, to leave and probably a number of other things. The other thing I want to point out, and this actually shows up um, in the textbook, but not in the slides or um, and I, they may show up in some of the material I provided to you, but um, in the beginning, uh, not the beginning, but in the, uh, 
if you look at the 1800s into the early 1900s, and this happened in 1911, laws protected businesses, not the people who worked in businesses. So remember, um, the other thing, I don't know if you heard him say this, is that the ladies who were working there were immigrants, and those immigrant women were 11 years old, 12 years old. These were children that were working in these factories. Um, and again, there were no rules that said you didn't have, you couldn't do that. So it was actually legal to have young children. And because New York was a city of immigrants, you know, if you go all the way back um, to time, you know, whether it's slavery or Italians or Irish, um, Chinese, you know, eventually Puerto Ricans, Dominicans, and everyone else who's now popped into come into New York City. Um, they did. They could barely speak the language, and they also needed jobs and some way to provide welfare for their home. So you had young girls working in uh, in these factories. Um, so the, the point that's important to remember also is that the, the federal law um, was protecting businesses. So the states were kind of mirroring what the federal laws. Were doing. So um, the owners had more protection than the people working in those shops. Right. So it's important to remember that. OK, so, yeah, this is this. And then, of course, um, I, I'm trying to think of the president um, and his wife. Um, uh, I can't think of her name. Anyway, she actually got up with the um, with the union. The first union in the U.S. was actually started in New York. It was started in Oregon, believe it or not. But um, the union then stepped up. And of course, um, with a lot of Roosevelt. Um, I'm trying to think of his Eleanor? yeah 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 the the one yeah. whose wife was a really tough lady um, yeah Eleanor she got out there and and a lot of and she was pushing for a lot of change for women's rights and because this involved mostly women and girls um, and and because these are the people who were shopping and buying things it's kind of the same thing with Jim Crow and Black Americans who decided not to drive ride the buses in um, Selma Alabama which put pressure on the local economy. They did the same thing. So um, yeah. then they made changes. So this was a case of um, a moral transgression because all of you said this isn't right. And of course, because remember, we started by talking about on Monday, um, where do your morals come from? Well, it comes from how we're raised, right? Um, and, it, and so at this time, uh, and, and also something to keep in mind, like one of the... Um, um, Actually, the largest law practice in New York is SCAD Law. And SCAD Law was um, set up um, by a Jewish community. And if you go to City College, they actually have a program called SCAD Law. Um, because in the beginning, uh, law was done in the back room over a glass of sherry. Um, and they were essentially um, white men, and it was really to protect companies. But they didn't go in to the courts to actually fight a crime. And so the and the Jews who came into New York decided, well, we can't get into that group because we're not allowed. They won't accept us as an nepotism. So we'll just fight all the um, char the, the crime that actually happens in court. Well, as more and more um, cases came into the courts, kind of like this, where individuals were fighting against companies um, and um, they needed to actually have a trial law, the law firms at the time were not, um, they didn't have um, experience working in trial law. So SCAD Law um, started picking up all of these cases, and um, that's how they became the largest law practice in New York City. Right? So a lot of things were actually changing over um, that were more and more focused on the worker and the consumer, because even the consumers didn't have rights. So if you look at some of the slides, you'll see that there's even the Bill of Rights for Consumers. The last one that went in was by Clinton that you have service um, in a kind way, you can't just threaten uh, people to bring products back. Um, so, so it's it's also important to understand how things happen historically. So, let me play this other video, and I want I'm asking the very same question, the very same question. Um, yeah, this one. I thought I was watching a movie, Towering Inferno at first. And then I looked real close 
And I noticed it was the World Trade Center. I was compelled because I'm a type of person that can't stand by and watch other people suffer. And to me, they were suffering. They wanted to get off the island. And there was no way for them to get off the island other than the water. And I had noticed when I was watching the television, I saw a lot of, you know, the ferries going up into the slips and taking people off. I said, fine, we could do the same thing. I could take people on my boat, get in there, take them where they have to go. And that's what we did. On the morning of September 11th, when the towers came down, millions of people ran for safety. Hundreds of thousands of them ran south to the water's edge. That's when they realized that Manhattan is indeed an island and that they were trapped. They were feeling helpless. And that's the worst feeling in the world. What was a person on the ground going to do? Buildings were down. There were people laying under the rubble of the building. Firemen, civilians. My wife was there, and I turned around. I says, I have got to go do something. Just like that. And she looked at me. She says, what are you going to do, you maniac? I says, I'm going to take the Amberjack up into the city and help. She says, but what if they're attacked again? I says, well, then that's something I have to live with. I says, I have to do what I have to do. I says, and nobody can stop me right now. E even if I save one person or I rescue one person, that's one person less that will suffer and die. They were trying to evacuate Manhattan because nobody knew what was going on. You know, you didn't know something else was going to happen. It was just a uh, you know, a madness on one side and, you know, and wanting to help people on the other side. They were just streaming out of the buildings and the first mode of transportation they saw was a, a ferry boat. That's when they knew, this is how I'm getting out of here. So they didn't even care where the boat was going. There wasn't panic in New York in the beginning, just volume. It wasn't until the first building fell that there was panic. <laughs> You heard the building go down, but we're in the slip, so we can't see it. That's when we started letting go, and then all of a sudden, you engulfed. You couldn't see anything. People were actually jumping into the river and swimming out of Manhattan. Boats were very nearly running them over. These people wanted out of Manhattan, no matter any way they could. Somebody wants you to go over there. Every mode of transportation out of Manhattan was shut down. All the subways were shut. Tunnels were all closed. They closed the bridges. They closed everything immediately. Boats, usually an afterthought in most New Yorkers' minds, were for the first time in over a century the only way in or out of lower Manhattan. process that actually had already started. There were some boats that were grabbing people that people were lined up at the walls. It's just human nature. You see people in distress on the seawall in Manhattan begging you to pick them up. You have to. You have to pick them up. They didn't know what was going on. They seen the building getting hit with these two planks. As far as they were concerned, you know, we were being bombed. I was wondering if they were going to come on the boat, if, if they were, had people with bombs or if they were going to come on. We're a big orange target in the middle of that harbor. My job is to keep the boat safe, my passengers safe, my crew safe. Everybody was in shock, running around. They didn't want to leave their family. They had loved ones running around the city. One guy ran from the apron. He jumped onto the boat. He grabbed onto the metal, climbed up right next to the pilot. So I'm going out there to say something. He slides down to the next deck. So the, the deck kids got him and go, what, you know, what are you doing? He goes, I'm jumping for my life. So, you know, you got to argue with him there.
there was a small boat that was uh, at the lower tip of Manhattan. I thought the boat was going to flip over because so many people were trying to get on. And as I looked behind, there were, there were just 10 deep. That's kind of what gave us the idea. We decided that this has to get better organized and we better do it. And that's what we did. We decided to make the call on the radio. All available boats. This is the United States Coast Guard board, the pilot boat in New York. Anyone want to help with the evacuation of Lower Manhattan? And that call came on the radio. They were coming. I was uncertain of who was going to respond. About 15, 20 minutes later, there's just boats all across the horizon. Literally, a hundred targets converging on the lower part of Manhattan. When we came out of that dust cloud, tugboats, I've never seen so many tugboats all at once. It was just like a fleet of tugboats headed to Manhattan. If it floated and they could get there, they got it. All different size eggs are going. I mean, the name was blowing across the board. Ferries, private boats, party boats. I worked on the water for 28 years. I've never seen that many boats come together one time that fast. One radio call, and it just came together just that fast. Hundreds of boats converged on the city leaving the sun-bathed harbor behind them. Dead ahead, the unknown. That was something I won't forget. It was just low, dark, acne, black smoke. It's like there was a big chimney in Manhattan. When we pulled into Pier 11, the dust was unbelievable. And then out of nowhere, you just kept on seeing people coming. They looked like zombies coming through the fog, and you knew that they were, those were human beings. Don't leave us. Please don't leave us here. Take us. Wow. At that point, the Coast Guard said, not how many people are you allowed? How many people can you fit? Come on, guys. Anybody coming? Get me out of here. Boats. Well, Started hanging, literally would take a bed sheet off a bunk and then a can of spray paint and paint their destination on. Some of these people never been in the water, never been on a boat before. Housewives, workers at the windows. We had executives. And the thing that was the best. Thank you. Everyone helped them. I saw four businessmen lifting up an old woman with a seeing eye dog, a German shepherd, and they lifted her up like a surfboard and passed her over the handrails. When we would carry a load of people over, and there was somebody standing there that seen her husband or wife, you know, that made us feel even better, you know. Well, at least we got two back together. Keep on going, you know. The guy that works at the ferry, he's a, a welder. His son was on my boat. He he actually came up. He thanked me. We went back and forth all day long, carrying boat loads, as many as our, our boat would hold. And it's a lot of people. A lot of people. You couldn't have planned nothing. To happen that fast that quick. No training. This was just people doing what they had to do that day. You forget all about what you're supposed to do, what the teachers do, and you say, you know what? Morally, this is the right way to go. And deep down, this is what I'm going to do. Average people, they stepped up uh, when they needed to. They showed me, you know, when the American people need to come together and pull together, they will do it. I do feel a way honored that I was part of it. That was the greatest thing I ever did in my life. The greatest day that I've ever seen in all my boating, I mean, my life on the water. The great boat lift of 9-11 became the largest sea evacuation in history. Larger than the evacuation of Dunkirk in World War II, where 339,000 British and French soldiers 
were rescued over the course of nine days. On 9-11, nearly 500,000 civilians were rescued from Manhattan by boat. It took less than nine hours. I believe somebody has a little hero in them. Got to look in. And it's in there. It'll come out. It made to be. I have one theory in life. I never want to say the word I should have. If I do it and I fail, I tried. If I do it and I succeed, better for me. And I tell my children the same thing. Never go through life saying you should have. If you want to do something, you do it. All right, same question. How will morals and or ethics applied here um, either in, 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 in this situation uh, where morals or ethics um, supported in the right way or broken? And I'll explain to you why I make this point because I, I can pretty much guess what most people are going to say, but I just want you to say it. Um, it was morals, right? Like, it was how you're brought up what was and what you believe in, what was moral, what's like, right. Basically, what was moral about what people did? Uh, you know, to, to potentially risk their own lives to save the lives of other people is, is moral, right? Like, it's not exactly a rule as, like, ethics would be. They, uh, they stepped up. That was pretty cool. All right. Anyone else? I would say it was um morally uh, right that that they um they went they went and gathered. Well, one of them called um in their boats saying that oh like we sh we should all go to Lower Manhattan and rescue everybody, which that's a morally right right thing to do. So and that like and. Since that, um, they they rescued like five hundred thousand people, so I I think it's morally right. Okay, and so they were morally right because they, it because of what? Because they did they went and rescued these people, and if you think about, some of them said we were never trained to do this. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So there was something inside that governed their decision. So whether it's your parents saying do the right thing, whether it's your faith your community, your culture, your nationality. Like you always hear about Americans stepping up. <clears throat> and here in New York, and I'm from the Bay Area, we had some pretty severe earthquakes where people had to do more or less the same type of thing, uh, rescuing people out of burning buildings and stuff like that. Um, so, but the other question then is, did they do, what is what they did ethically correct? Well, they definitely broke the rules. Yeah, you know, like the you know the rules of the road and and uh, like the nautical rules of the road, like pretty much they broke every rule in the book to do the right thing. So specifically, what did they do that was ethically wrong? Um, well, they you know put too many people on on boats. They, you know, there were way too many targets heading to one specific location. Um, you know, like that can cause collisions. Like that's, you know, like, like ethically it's the wrong thing to do, but morally it's the right thing to do. Right. Anyone else? No, I would agree. I would agree as well. Um, like, like God forbid, like, um, the, the boats, like they will crash each other because of how many boats were there. And, um, but like morally, they felt the right to like save all those people. So I agree with what um, he said. Okay, anyone else? So the guy who was um, the captain of the um, Staten Island Ferry said, my job is to protect the boat and to protect the people on the boat. Notice he said boat first, right? It's still in many cases when you work for these companies, um, the companies are concerned about their assets because 
they're especially private run companies they're owned by state by shareholders and they have a fiscal or fiduciary responsibility to um, be highly productive very efficient and to uh, protect uh, the assets that they have and then because laws and things have changed you have to protect the people on the boat like there has to be enough uh, preservers on the boat um, everybody working on the boat has to be able to get people off the boat if something happens, et cetera, those kind of things. And if you remember, one of the guys even said um, it, it was morally the right thing to do. He literally used the word morally. But um, as John was pointing out and was, uh, and as Anthony was pointing out, um, there are rules of the waterway. I mean, I sail, I do kayaking. Um, if you ever get on a ferry and you hear him honk three times, um, that's what a captain is supposed to do because there are crafts that are smaller than your own that you can't see. And God forbid yeah. something fell in the water. So there has to be an alert or warning. And it's these are rules of the waterway. So there's rules of for the boat and then there's rules of the waterway. Um, <clears throat> and, and I've done kayaking where I've actually guided swimmers. The other thing is that if you've ever been in the, the bay south of the lower Manhattan, uh, north of Governor's Island, their currents running, because if you think about it, the Hudson, which is a very powerful river, um, mm -hmm. all the rivers go in and out twice a day. Well, imagine they're going out. And remember, if you pass that an island in New Jersey, you're in the Atlantic Ocean. So there's a big yeah. one. So um, you also have that concern. So to the point where you've overloaded the boat and they could flip and drown people. Flip it easy. You also just dump people into the bay, which gets sucked out into the ocean. And then, of course, these guys are coming into black. I mean, there's it's like this dark smoke coming in, so they can't even see um, the seawall, you know, and, you know where they're supposed to go. And, mm -hmm. You know, and then there's lights that tell you what's left, what's right, and you, you can't even see the lights for the craft. So the reason I brought this up, and I'm pretty sure everybody would support the argument that it was the morally inconscionable right thing to do, but in both these cases, moral if you look at the rule of morals if you look at your compass and say based on what you're supposed to do and what you're not supposed to do in both cases there were morals that were broken and morals that were supported but in both cases rules were broken and i bring this up only to point out that when you think of what um ethics are and some people decide to go into law um ethics are about right and wrong and in some cases, companies will do things that are better um, than what's expected. Um, we don't always hear this story and we don't always get it to experience this story, but like what they did on 9-11, they, they went beyond um, what was expected, right? Um, trying to remember where my slides are. When I turn the computer on, I always wanted to things wind up shutting off and I'm pretty sure this shut off. So I got to bring it back up because I try to have the class ready before you guys show up. But I think in this case, Click on one other place. All right, let me. Okay, all right, hold on. I've got a slide didn't open. I have to go somewhere else to open it. All right. Yes, for some reason, sometimes PowerPoints, I'm running I'm running a, a Mac and sometimes my slides refuse to cooperate. And it's, well, this is one of those times. So let me find it in another place.
All right, I think uh, I think I got it. All right, let me go back here. I'm just gonna play it in a tab because it's not opening by itself for some reason. All right, so in the book, there's this this pyramid. Hopefully, you can see it on the screen. I'm afraid oh. to open it because it may not. But if you notice, it says the bottom level. So these are um, there's a thing called corporate social responsibility. And where you may be familiar with this is that, uh, and oh, by the way, um, for just in case so some of you aren't aware of it, um, the Coast Guard school is actually here in New York. So I wasn't surprised to see the Coast Guard show up in large numbers. Um, yeah. You know, the Air Force is in Colorado. Um, the uh, Navy is in Annapolis, Maryland. The um, Army is primarily in Texas. Uh, and um, the Marines are out yeah. Southern California. Yeah, West Point up in New York. Yeah, in West Point in New York. And then the Marines yeah. are in Southern Cal. Um, yeah. But the Coast Guard's here in New York. So um, anyway, so um, you see at the bottom, it says economic responsibility. So there's a responsibility of the company uh, and businesses to meet their fiduciary responsibility of the shareholders. So if you um, uh, invest in like Apple computers or Apple, it's now called Apple, um, you are an owner of the company and they have a responsibility to you as an investor or you can choose not to invest, right? Um, and there's nothing wrong with that, but that is what's called an economic responsibility. The next is a legal one. In other words, there are things that you must do, have to do, um, are required to do, or you can suffer under penalty of law. So, uh, and then the next one is um, ethical because a company can go beyond the rule of the ethic um the um, the economic responsibility they have and the legal responsibility and do even more. So when we think about what um, those those guys on the boats were doing, um, they were they were expanding. Actually, they were doing things that were morally right, but the company could also say that we will allow you to do X Y Z. You know, another example that comes to mind is when uh, United Air um, got hit by a bunch of birds coming out of LaGuardia and they lost power and then you probably heard of sully and they did a movie about him and now he's a consultant but he had to land the plane in the hudson river and the boats had to come out and save them so there were things that um as a result of that that the airlines and some of the um boat crafts um they changed their roles they didn't they didn't economically have to do certain things because it went beyond the cost of running the business and they didn't legally have to do certain things but they decided to, the companies decided to uh, create um, additional um, measures that these boats who were normally just ferries could do in case of emergency. So this is basically stepping beyond. And then the ultimate is philanthropic. Um, the highest level it says of the triangle philanthropic responsibilities can be considered only after economic, legal, and ethical. So this is when, um, for instance, um, it, it, what's become corporate social responsibility um, has become strategic corporate social responsibility. So what I mean by that is if you're driving along the freeway and it says the XYZ company here, um, the name of the company there, what they'll say is we're going to put some money in and we're going to let our employees go out and clean this part of the highway. So we're going to take ownership of this. Um, and you see these kind of things done all the time where a company will cut a check. The philanthropic and strategic one, and you'll notice in my um, chapter two folder, you'll see that um, um, I include a lot of stuff in here about um, the airline industry, especially um, pilots and um, pilots and um, uh, air traffic control, and because they are predominantly um, these and these industries were predominantly run by white men um, and only men, um, there's been a change. And so the change now leans towards um, diversifying these fields. And so um, you've got airlines now and businesses that are funding to allow uh, people of color and um, women to actually go into these fields and paying for it. Because this is a very expensive um, field to have to be able to, to go into. Um, in other words, uh, if you want to become a pilot, you have you, you can certainly become a, a pilot of a private plane like a Cessna. I've flown a Cessna before, um, just one flight, 
uh, over an extended period of time costs four hundred dollars. And so you can join schools, and then you pay um, a, a smaller fee. And then, of course, there's the cost of renting the plane and all this other stuff. It's not even about owning a plane, but to fly a commercial craft. Normally, these people come out of the Air Force. They come out of flying FedEx and UPS because you can't just take 300 souls up into the air because you flew a simulator or you flew a Cessna. It's a very different type of craft. And so companies are, are poning up the money to get um, a more diverse population to actually go into these fields. And by the way, they pay a really good money. Um, small six-figure salary, especially if you become air traffic controller, right? So this is more um, philanthropic because they don't have to do this, right? They don't have to do this. All right, so let's go back to, there was something else I wanted to bring up. Uh, and then some businesses are getting into what's called um, uh, B Corps. And a B Corporation, also referred to as a Benefits Corporation started in 2010 in Maryland and now spreading around the country. And where it comes from, let me use my, because it's not in the textbook, I'm surprised it's not there because we're definitely referring to it. Um, where it comes from, So it's referred to as the three Ps. And when you see this, you think of sustainable and impact vesting. All right, so this is a big thing now. Um, so um, the state of California made a decision during um, about a year or so ago um, that in the year two thousand, starting in the year twenty thirty five, uh, car companies that sell new cars will not be allowed to sell cars that are run by fuel. In other words, um, they will have to run on alternative energy because California typically leads the country in um, doing things like how do we keep the air cleaner, how do we reduce air uh, noise pollution, on and on and on, things like that. And General Motors announced soon after that, that in, by starting in 2035, they will no longer sell cars, brand new cars that are run on fuel, like gasoline, right? And so business before that, because this goes back to 2010, businesses started figuring out how do we do things that use less water? How do we do things that use no plastic? How do we do things that um, are healthier for um, people to eat? make the air easier to breathe, things like that, right? And so the three P's stand for, um, the, before I write it down, does anybody know what the three P's stand for? Mm -hmm. No, okay. It stands for planet, people, and profit. And so the idea is that you can still make a profit, but you have to do what's right by the planet and by people. And so if you live in Brooklyn, um, where you see lots of these um, fair trade coffee, mom and pop coffee shops, it's because in, well, coffee was first created in Ethiopia and Africa. Um, and a number of these countries there and in the middle and in, in Central America um, have experienced civil war. And where they were making money is through coffee. And so, um, I've got another whole bunch of videos that I didn't even add to this class, but where um, women are left over with their, with whatever children are left after their husbands, their brothers, their fathers, their sons have gone to war and died. And so companies would go down to these countries, whether it's in Africa or, or in Central America, and, and the, the coffee um, buyers, they buy the beans, would go in there and buy millions and millions of dollars worth of coffee beans. The problem was um, they were going in and so the woman may say, I need $1,000 because that gives me $100 profit for the month. It costs me 900 to produce and they're carrying jerry cans on their head for water and they're bent over backwards pulling, the, you know, attending to their, their, their coffee plants and pulling these beans by hand um, just to make enough money to take care of their kids and provide a very, very low subsistence of living. And so the broker would go in and say, well, it costs you 900, I'm gonna give you 900. And so they were basically taking advantage of it. And that's where fair trade coffee places popped up. And some of these owners will literally fly to the farms where they're at 
and say, I want to do business with you. And this is how much money I'm prepared to give to you. And they were, um, they were making direct purchases and buying organizations that were treating these uh, and primarily women fairly uh, in order to buy these um, coffee beans. Um, and that's where fair trade came about. And so this is kind of the same thing. Um, in other words, don't screw over the people um, and don't screw over the planet. There's nothing wrong with making profit. There's nothing wrong with getting rich. There's nothing wrong with capitalism. As a matter of fact, it creates great, um, great societies. But you don't have to do it as a greedy person and take advantage um, by destroying the planet and destroying people's lives. And that's kind of what 3P is. Um, by the way, does anyone know um, who the, the two or three largest coffee buyers, um, who they are in the United States? Coffee buyers? Yeah, they buy the beans. Um, let's see. You're probably uh, Washington? No, the Seattle? Seattle? Companies. Oh, the company? Oh, Starbucks. Uh, let's see. Um, yeah, Black Rifle, maybe. I'm sorry? Uh, Black Rifle Coffee? They do, they do a lot of coffee nowadays. I don't know what you're saying. Uh, Black, Black Rifle Coffee, the coffee company? Oh, Black Okay. So, Starbucks is one. McDonald's and um, believe Dunkin it or not, Marriott Hotels. Oh, wow. Yeah, because they have such a large um, presence. Um, so anyway, it's another thing to think about. So the next thing I want to ask you about, um, and actually, uh, I, I'm sorry, and if you, oh, I, I took it off. And on the screen, you'll see this um, where, you know, I'm going to hold off showing it just to make sure I cover everything. But if I get a chance later, I'll show it. But there's Grace um, Grayson Bakery. Um, are, anyone in the class, does anyone in the class live in Yonkers? Is it, or, or close by in Bronx or Bronxville? Nobody? Okay. I guess nobody lives up there. Um, anyway, that's where Grayson Bakery is and located. And it's one of the first, it was a company that was started by someone who was Jewish and believe it or not, a, um, a rocket scientist. Uh, who became a monk um, and a baker. And he decided, um, I think this was, if not the 80s, the 70s, I've lost track of time. I've actually taken student groups up to to this bakery um, because they do um, tours. Um, but um, I think it was either the, the 70s or the 80s, but he decided that uh, people who are uh, coming out of jail, um, who haven't committed a capital crime, like kill somebody or, um, you know, steal something of great value, but, you know, petty theft and selling pot and things like that. But, you know, those kind of things who often have a very difficult time finding a job and wind up becoming repeat offenders um, need a job. And so they say, you know, we're going to open up. He said he decided to open up this bakery um, and it's not a bakery where you get a donut or something. He was baking goods to actually sell to other companies. Um that they, he would hire them and they have an open door policy that you go in and um, you can actually um, learn a skill and stay as long as you can. I actually know a woman personally in Brazil that does the same thing, um, not with uh, people who are form, former, um, formerly in prison or, or in jail, um, but uh, indigenous people who live in the mountains who are trying to earn some money. She teaches them um, how to do this comes into a restaurant and in both cases um, they have these um, uh, life counsel and career counselors on site um, and then they they find other places from the work so in the case of Grayson after you've done it a while um, there's lots of jobs that you can get whether it's in large restaurants companies that do similar things but at a larger scale um, and hotels right and so um this is a B Corp or, or benefits corporation and they get tax breaks and incentives. They actually also get to um, channel some of their tax money into areas that they believe are important to them and are local to their community. So um, from a governmental standpoint, um, the, 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 if these companies do right by citizens, then the government does right by them. Right. So they are a for-profit company that does this. They're big, um, um, where they did a really where they got their first big break was with um, 
Ben and Jerry's up in Vermont, which which they have always been socially conscious. Uh, of course, Ben and Jerry's now is owned by um, Unilever, which is um, a foreign company that is the largest um, seller of ice cream in the world. So anyway, um, if we have time, I'll show this one later because it's basically the the trajectory of one man's life um, from jail to Grayson to um, finding his way um, through this. This is another reason why capital capitalism is not always a bad thing. It's just that there's always there's always going to be bad people who do wrong things sometimes <clears throat> in it. All right, so let's move on. So the next thing I want to ask you about, um, and this was from, um, this is from what I gave to you in the announcement. Um, can somebody tell me what, um, and I'm going to come back to the last, the, the top two questions in a, in a moment, but can, there's a few things. So, um, so the, the so I'm going to go down the list over here. The first one was on um, gender gap. So I'm going to have to assume that you guys have watched these because I can't play all these videos, even though they're well. I'll play this one because it's kind of cute in a way, but it also makes a point. It also makes a point. So let me let me play it just so that now that we've. Uh, Let me just play it real quick. It's, you know, it is kind of cute. There's two of them actually, but I'll just play the first one. So you should have all seen this already because it was part of your assignment to do. Um, if I can get to the, I really got to start shutting things down before I start class. This, I've got too much stuff stressing out my internet oh come on where are you goodbye feminist i'd make it a wrinkle What did you get? Five dollars. That's just the ladies. <laughs> Seven dollars. It should be flat out illegal, like, I'm not joking, I'm not being unreasonable. Women and men should have the same money. They should have 50-50, 60-60, if you want to do 120. It should just be how hard you work. If you do the same work, you should get paid the same money. What we're trying to tell you is that it's not fair that boys get paid more than girls. Maybe if the men notice they were being paid more than the women, they should speak up about it. When I am older, I'm going to make a change. If I could. Ugh. Ugh, I have no words, it's so wrong. Okay, so... Uh... Drink. There we go. All right. So, so does anyone know what the um, on average in the United States what the um, difference or the gap is between in pay between men and women in general? And and I've heard and, I've, you know, I've heard it's seventy seven cents on the dollar, but yeah, it's seventy seven cents on the dollar. So in the book, of course, they break it down because you can break it down into African American, Latin, um, Asian, and then white. But on average, it's 77 cents. And it's still that way. And I brought it up in the last class um, and added it, I think, in here somewhere. Yeah, well, I don't know where it is now. But anyway, I put the thing in there on Billie Jean because now the U.S. Open, one of the largest um, athletic events, um, and they made a point of this. If you watch the U.S. Open, 
when they announced the, the cash prize money, they said, and the women, and they would say, first place is $3 million. And when the man came up, they said, and the men, $3 million. And so men and women are paid exactly the same at the U.S. Open now in uh, prize money, right? So um, this, again, um, goes to the point of um, what is um, beyond morally right, but um, ethically right and wrong. And so as a result, um, with pressure, because um, as it turns out, there are more women going into college now, which means there's more women who are going to be going into corporations and investing in companies, as well as buying things from companies. And so there's a lot of pressure on businesses now to make changes, right? Um, and so this is beyond diversity of race and faith and things like that. But even um, in terms of gender, you know, businesses are having to uh, put up or shut up because they're gonna have to be responsive to the demands that not only Gen Z and millennials are placing on business, but the fact that there's more and more women going in um, into the workforce coming out of college, right? Um, the next one was DEI. Can someone tell me what DE and I stand for and also what 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 they mean? So remember, I, I said before the class to make your notes on so, that. I'm going to ask you. Something. Diversity, equity, um, inclu inclusion, and equity. Okay, so diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, can you tell me what that means and can you give me an example? Uh, I would say an example is... For which one? Um, for um, diversity or would be more employing more like people of color? Keep going, okay. Uh, for inclusion in are terms there, of are there um, any others for diversity? Oh, diversity. Um, uh, not that I can think of off the top of my head. Okay, so anyone else before we jump out of diversity? Anyone else? Uh, age? Say it again. Age? Age, okay. Because there is a thing called age discrimination and it's against the law. Um, but the fact that the pop our population is getting older because people are living longer, um, you've got well, to not only make accommodation but cre create jobs so that well, someone who's 80 years, someone who's 70 years old it's probably got doesn't have the same physical abilities that Hello? who's in their twenties. What else? Martin, did you say something else? No, I didn't say anything else. I'm sorry. Okay. Anyone else? Anyone else? So I'm gonna start calling out. What? Oh. Go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, uh, would you put like gender? And yes, of course. Like, gender. Besides, like male and female, all oh, male and female. So Brian like, brought up religion. Yeah. So, for instance, if you're Jewish, you can't work beyond sundown on Fridays, and um, the Sabbath has to be honored. And I think um, um, Hasidic Jews, um, there are actually, believe it or not, elevators in Manhattan and throughout New York City because um, men are not allowed to do any physical work. So they can't even push the buttons in the elevators. So you've got um, elevators that will literally stop on it, every floor in the building. Um, you know, and then they fi finally, especially um, like in CUNY, uh, people of Muslim background are now their, their holidays are being honored as well, right? So um, yeah, and there's even, uh, if you're Muslim, you probably know this, there's a thing called a Muslim loan because you're not allowed to pay interest. So the loan is structured very differently. Hmm. Yeah, anyone else? Um, I'm not, I'm pretty sure that I heard that if you have like a disability, then they're not supposed to be like, no, you can't get the job. Right, well, there's clearly some jobs you can't do. You can't fly a plane or drive a bus, but 
Yeah, but yeah, you have to, um, where you can do the job, there has to be accommodation. So uh, large companies are put under a lot of um, pressure to make sure they do the right things. Like work, imagine working for Citibank or IBM. These are companies that are in all the states and in a lot of countries, which means the federal law looks at them. Um, and so for instance, you have to have braille um, you have to have, if you go in the elevator, there's braille on right next to the buttons because blind people have to be able to read it. Um, if you have a seeing eye dog, you know, some stores say you can't bring them in unless, and whether it's for, um, emotional disability, PTSD, uh, post-traumatic stress disorder, PTSD, um, yeah. or, um, or you're blind, uh, if you are deaf, my class over the summer, I had a student who was hearing impaired. We, they, the, because again, you are a public university uh, and this is a mandated by the state of New York. There were always two translators and one note taker in the class. Um, people always wonder why she got a note taker. I said, try watching a video or listening to the professor or another student um, reading their lips or reading the closed caption on the, on the video and take notes at the same time. It's, it's virtually impossible because everything she could, all of her information is consumed through her eyes. Right. So yeah. Um, and, and I'm probably leaving a bunch of them out wheelchair. There's still issues in some States where people can't even get into a building because there's no wheelchair access. Right. So, um, so yeah, disability, uh, uh, physical, um, disability, and that includes emotional and now mental health care is such a big thing right now. Um, that that more and more you've seen that cross through across the United States where people have to be given time. So for instance, if you were in Thailand and you were feeling mentally stressed out as a as a as a law within the country, you're allowed to stop working, go back to your province and spend two weeks with your monk to get your head straight and then come back and your job has to be there for you. Of course the there there's still laws that have to change in the US <clears throat> for, for when a woman gives birth to a child, um, in most countries, they're given months and months off to basically uh, establish a relationship with that child. In the U.S., you get, I don't know, days, weeks, right? So that has to be changed as well. Are there any others that anyone can think of as far as diversity? So you have people of color, people of different faiths, people of... Um, um, forms of disability, age. And by the way, age is not just older. It could be younger too, because if you are 21, 22 and trying to get a job and you're competing against someone with 10 years experience, right? Um, that can happen, you know, against you as well, right? Yes, um, especially like when you're 16 and they'd be like, you can work at 16, but they'd be like acting for like experience. Yeah, like what babysitting. So yeah, there, there are issues there, and in states um, um, like California and Texas and Florida, um, where you have to drive, um, that also becomes a, a bit a, a bit problematic, um, and that's why the driving age is much younger in those places, right? So we we kind of had uh, an idea of of um, of uh, diversity. Um, and of course, gender, women, right? Women should be allowed to do pretty much everything a man can do. What about um, equity? What's equity? Um, equity uh, is like to be like impartial, right? It's uh, to be fair and like consider like people's individual needs. So before I... Um, say anything about what you said. Can you give me an example based on what you said? Of equity? Um, yeah, I mean, you know, like the B Corp, right? They, um, people like are getting what? out of prison. What? Like the B Corp you were talking the about? B Corp, right, that B Corporation, go ahead. Right, so these people who are obviously in prison, um, they're gonna need individualized help to establish them in the workforce. It's not gonna be the same kind of uh equity say is you know i would have or somebody else would have who's never been in prison so don't use the word equity to define equity so say it in another way so they 
will need the same type of what? Uh, treatment. Um, uh, I don't know how else to put it. Like, so, um, so when you use the word fair, you know, which is a little different because fair to me means the same opportunity to have the job. Right. Or like impartial. Okay, so, okay, let me hear what other people have to say, because I'll give you an example, because you may be saying it, and I'm just not fully... Maybe I'm, maybe I'm saying it wrong. No, it's not a question of right and wrong. It's just a question of me understanding based on the context you put it in. So I may not be understanding. That's why I want people to give examples, because sometimes even I don't have the best example. Is it, does anyone um, else have an idea of what equity is? Um, Like, I, I noticed, like, when you apply to jobs, they give you like a questionnaire at the end and they ask you um if you had if you've ever been convicted of a crime or if you ever had like public assistance if anyone in your family has public assistance or things like that okay and so where is it not where is it not equitable in other words if somebody has not received public assistance if somebody has not been through bankruptcy if someone hasn't gone through a foreclosure, if someone hasn't been incarcerated, do a comparison. Mm -hmm. Or nowadays, your FICA score, because you can even be blocked out of going to a college because your your FICA score is low, and you, as well as a job. Mm -hmm. So here's an example, because you guys may be saying it, and I'm just not understanding it. Let's say that you work for a company, and it's an engineering. And so typically, they're the men working in the company. And the company does really well. And at the um, so they decide at the end of the month, you know what, we want to celebrate everybody's successes. And so we're going to have a beer party, and we're going to give out t-shirts. And the women who are working in the company come up and said, look, first of all, I don't drink beer. Uh, and second of all, the shirts that you buy are large XL, XXL, and XXXL because of all the beer you drink. So you have nothing for us. And so, you know, the 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 inequity here is that you are providing a benefit or, or, or a bonus or prize for all of us, including the women in the company for doing well, but we're not sharing in it in an equitable way, meaning um we're not getting the same benefit in other words it's not the shirt it's the benefit of the shirt you're giving us the wrong thing to celebrate the benefit so therefore we aren't getting the benefit right and so some companies recognize that in silicon valley and said you know what this is what we're going to do we're going to um give you half a day off because oftentimes the women are raising kids and they would do anything to spend time with their kids. So we're going to give, you know, we're going to stop working halfway through the day and we're going to have this beer party. And for those of you who would rather do something else, even if it's men, because there's men that want to see their kids, there are men that are raising kids by themselves, but also these women, you get to go spend that time with your kids, right? And so what you've, what you've done as a company is saying, we recognize the extra work that you've done and we want to um, celebrate that and we want to give you a benefit. In other words, something that you you value as a benefit, but we've also got to do it in a way that's equitable, meaning we have to give you something that you value the same as what these men are going to have when they drink that beer and put that big t-shirt on. So when you guys were saying um, we should have the same opportunity to get a job, um, even if we have a criminal record or we have a bankruptcy, or um, all these other egregious things that have happened um, because the other side would say, hey, wait a minute, I didn't go to jail. Well, I'm not getting any more benefit than they are. They're getting the same benefit, right? And, and the, But the people who've gone through these um, challenges in their lives, like a criminal record, are saying, um, I can work just as hard. I made a mistake and um, I want to also get that job, but I need to cross that bridge to get to it and so by providing, for instance, um, Grayson provides uh, life counseling, career counseling. They even bought a building so that women who have children can place those children. They bought another building that said, look, you, 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 we're not, you're not paying us $100,000 a year. How am I going to afford child care, a home, um, send my kids to school and all that? So they bought a building and said, you can live in this building. And they um, 
discounted the cost of living. So they actually stepped up and, and put a buffer in place so that these people had a way to actually live a normal life while still having that job, right? So in the end, they got the same benefit of a job that they could be proud of, they can develop a skill and actually grow into while still being able to raise a family just like anyone else who didn't have a criminal record. So that that's what um, is meant by equity because the, the, the issue here um, oftentimes is that people mistake in what, what equal means and what equity means. They're not the same, right? Equal, right. Me, equal means, look, we, we, we posted a job, you, you can apply for the job, we treated you equally. Yeah, you did, but we're not equal. And so if you think back to when women couldn't own homes without a man signing, when a black person couldn't vote, they call it a poll tax. They literally said, if you don't own a home with a mailbox out in front of it, with a poll sticking out of it, then you can't vote, right? And there's even these other issues now where you have to have certain IDs uh, in some states that are trying to manipulate um, individual right to be able to vote, right? So, you know, equal is equal, equity is equity, but they do not necessarily mean the same thing. Now, do they cross over sometimes? Probably, but they don't normally mean the same thing, okay? All right, the so last, go ahead, go so ahead. So um, equity considers like the individual needs of uh, a person. Right, so the way I would look at all three of these is use the word access. Okay. If I'm from a diverse, if I'm from a background that's um, considered minority or diverse, right? Um, do I have same access to this opportunity? If 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 um, if there's a benefit to be had, if there's an opportunity to be had, is it equitably distributed to to me as it is to the person next to me? Do I have okay. same access? If I look at it in terms of inclusion, right? And so in the case of inclusion, the term I would I would use is: Do I have a seat at the table? Have I right. been the same opportunity and in inclusion? So now you find more and more companies because especially during the pandemic and people were coming back uh, and people didn't want to come back. They're like, look, I'm not going to come back to this job because I don't feel valued in this job and I don't feel like I'm included in this job. So I'm just not coming back. And so you're finding more and more employers are uh, stepping up. For instance, if you look at sports, right, uh, the mm -hmm. NBA, Major League Baseball, NFL, Look, especially like, you know, you just saw the, the game uh, last night, but think about the game that Kansas City lost. Yeah. And I think mostly it's because their their big defensive tackle um, um, held out for more money. And the fact that he could hold out and nobody like scream bloody murder, there was a time when they would say, well, fine, you don't want to play for us this week, then don't come back. And now yeah. they have a union. Now – they have a public voice. Now there's social media. And now most of the leagues are player leagues as opposed to just owner leagues, right? The players are saying, we have a seat at the table. The women in the WNBA are screaming this over and over. The women in um, soccer are screaming this over and over and saying, yeah. we don't seem to have, first of all, there's an, a, there's an, an equitable distribution of the benefit called salary and bonus money. There's an inequitable distribution of viewership on television because TV is not providing the same um, access. But also, um, the, the argument for both sides up until now has been, we don't have a say in our own future and our own destiny. The big argument now is that uh, teams are sitting star athletes after fans have shown up and spent thousands of dollars. So it's gone from early the, the 1800s and early 1900s where corporations were protected to then consumers. And now they're looking at the, and, and employees, but now they're looking at other areas of employees and, um, and, and they're moving down the line, especially with B Corps down to consumers. Consumers always have the power of their purse. If they don't buy, you go out of business, right? Mm -hmm. More and more now you're beginning to see the culture of companies change. And of course, laws change. Right. And so DEI is about diversity, equity, and inclusion. Inclusion, think about it. Do I have a seat at the table? Do I have a seat at the table? And then all three, do I have access to whatever it is that I value, that um, that everyone values, um, et cetera? Um, whether I'm coming from a background of diversity, whether 
I'm getting the same benefit that someone else gets, as, and so that I'm being treated equitably. Um, and am I, um, 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 am I included? Do I feel a sense of inclusion in what I'm doing? Do I have a seat at the table? And I can tell you, as a black man working in an engineering space, when no one else looked like me when I would go out to work, I was made to feel less than included all the time. Even when they would bring me out and say, here's our diversity. And I'd be the only person standing there. And I'm like, I feel like a monkey in a, in a cage. And, and I don't feel like I'm any special, but I didn't want to lose my job. So I would go, I would do what I was told to do, right? It's different in the military, right? You got to do yeah. what you're doing, you know? You, you know we're, all, we're all the same, man. It, we, we don't see anything like that. We're all the same color. And you're working for the federal um, yeah. side, which means that the federal laws is, are, are coming to apply. It's different than if you work at the state level, right? Yeah. All right. So we have that. The next one is the difference between the boss and the leader. Can someone tell me what the difference is between a boss and a leader? And you probably saw the images that I put up. Maybe I should open up two. Can someone tell me what the well, difference between a boss and a leader? Well, uh, to me, um, especially coming from the military, to be a leader is a is a pretty big deal, right? So, like a boss, you're kind of looked at like a tyrant. Nobody really wants to work for you. You just don't want to get in trouble. But a leader, you lead from the front, and you 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 get this sense of camaraderie, and you want to work for that leader, you know. Okay, so what I gather from what you said, because you used the word tyrant. Yeah. Um, let's see, by, by Brian said, a boss command orders without doing anything. <laughs> right, and the boss will say, well, look, I commanded you, didn't I? No, but I get what you're saying, Brian. Um, yeah. and, but, but, and John was saying that it's someone that you don't necessarily want to work for. So, um, um, and, and there's a point to that, too, because what you'll, what is, okay. Um, because, I'm sorry, I'm trying to read the chat and listen in multitask. So, um, um, tyrant, right. So leaders typically are, um, are, 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 are um, what is the word? Um, trans transformational is the word. Um, mm. And bosses are transactional. And, and so for here's, here's an easy way to look at it. Um, if you do well on the job, they give you a raise. If you do poorly on the job, you don't get the raise. If you do really well, they give you a bonus, they give you a promotion, et cetera. If you do really poorly, you get um, put on a three month, whatever, to see if you improve. And then if it's still really bad, they fire you, right? That's a transaction. It says it's no different than if I go in the store and I buy this pen, the transaction is, I give them some money, they give me the pen, and you get a receipt, which means I have title to the pen. It's no different if you buy a house or a car, you get title, and the, and the receipt is a title, a title of ownership. Well, in school, if you work really hard, I give you a grade, that's a transaction. If you work in the job, I've already explained it, um, et cetera, on and on. If you play in a sport and you do well, you get to play on the field. If not, you sit on the bench, and if you really do poorly, you get kicked off, right? Um, Transformational um, are typically people with vision who see the bigger picture and they give you uh, a motivated reason. Um, leadership has, a, there, there are different forms of leadership and oftentimes people don't understand what motivation means. Um, does anybody know what motivation, when, if I were to motivate you, what would cause you to do something? What is it that you are looking for? Um a desire to complete a goal. So I have a desire for you to complete a goal and you have an inside desire to complete a goal, self-motivated. But if I yeah. want you to do something and I'm a boss or a leader, a boss is going to tell you to do it. If you, if you, if you want to get paid, you do what I tell you. A right. leader will give you a reason why. Like right? cultivate. So, especially your, your generation, you guys' generations, you're looking for a purpose or a reason to do the things that you do and lead or positive affirmation. Right. And so Harlan is saying positive affirmation. So when you do things, you want to be encouraged. So like, I like watching the little league baseball and they always put these commercials up 
of one guy saying, what's wrong with you? Can't you play better? If you want to play in this team, you're not doing working hard enough. And these are kids who are 12 years old. And then the other guy says, look, we're getting better um, um, because, you know, part of, of development is through learning. And part of learning is being able to fail. A lot of companies and places in society don't give room for failure. Failure, it's this way. If you don't fail, you won't grow. Um, and now, what 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 um, Aaron Rodgers went through is, is it may be uh. age is worse. But so um, uh, w- when you fail, you it's the first time you learn. A lot of times, first time you learn about how to do something because you just figured out how not to do something and then you improve on that and you add and you add and you add and you build and you build and you build and you build. And you build. Um, people always um, wonder what is elasticity? Elasticity isn't the ability for a rubber band um, to stretch. That's not elasticity. Elasticity is the ability to come back to your original form. And so like what's what happened to Roger, or Aaron Rodgers is you have stress, strain, fracture, and break. Right. And so he went past stress. He went past yeah. strain, which is when you pull a muscle. He went, he's at the fracture stage where he, he um, tore part of it and break is when it completely breaks. So learning is you want to go through stress motions. Anybody who's ever exercised, um, developed their muscles, developed their lung capacity, uh, et cetera, things like that, you have to tear muscle down for it to build up. It's the same thing about life. Right. And so leaders understand that. So when Sir Richard Branson shows up in town, I don't care if you work for Sir Richard Branson, if you're a traveler, if you've never traveled, no intention to travel or work for another competitor airline, people lean into the guy because he's a visionary. He has these incredible ideas and he's also charismatic and he can communicate. So these are things that are true about leaders. Um, So um, if you look at the captain on a baseball team, they were um, voted on, but they don't have official power. They're not paid to be the captain, but people lean into them because they're a leader on the team. The coach um, is trying, more and more coaches are becoming less boss and more uh, transformational leaders. The owners typically always wind up showing up as bosses. Uh, Matter of fact, Draymond Green of the, um, of the Warriors said he, he, this dislikes the term owner. He says he does. He says because it makes especially people of color feel like, and which is the, the majority of people playing in the NBA, like it's a plantation and, and there's a slave master. And this is why when you buy homes, they don't call it the master or the master suite anymore. They call it the primary or the owner suite because that term master leaves really bad taste in a lot of people's minds and hearts. It's just. So leaders are also con- conscientious and, and um, aware of the language they're using when they communicate. So, you know, the one that's here is that the boss, I think somebody in, um, put in there, um, you know, a boss is, is, is telling them, you'll find sweatshops in China where there was a movie called They Shoot Horses, don't they? They're typing as fast as they can or they're sewing as fast as they can. And if they can't sew any faster, they said they replace them and they bring someone else in. And and um, in the case of horses and stuff, they just go out and shoot them and get another horse and bring them in, right? In the case of leaders, the, the leader is literally out there in the front. Uh, in the military, you often see examples where the, you know, the, the, the field general is actually carrying the flag uh, in the front, leading his men and women uh, into battle, right? And so you, you see more and more um, this change and of course it shows up in this chapter because it brings into um into question especially uh with millennial and gen z look if you want me to work this hard then show me how to do it and and don't tell me what to do but get out there and actually do it so i can model now leaders can't always do it you get into a situation like a hospital the person who's at a hospital can't do brain surgery can't do open heart surgery can't deliver a baby can't do all those things unless you want to see a lot of people dying, right? But they should have some on-hand experience um, so that there's some credibility, okay? All right. right. Let's go back to the list. Um, 
Yeah. So what is a code of conduct or code of ethics? I think we kind of understand this because we kind of beat the whole term of ethics versus morality down. And a code of conduct is really just a statement of what is allowed and not allowed. And I gave examples in here. And from a university standpoint, Montclair has one of the best ones. But if you work for a company, I got to update this because they're not called Twitter anymore. But I've got the code of conduct or the written code of conduct for Twitter, for McDonald's, for Shake Shack. They're all in here. And even Montclair. Now, what is who is this for? You could be an educator in Montclair. You could be the educator or the faculty. You could be staff, administration. You could be security guard. But you could also be the supplier who's providing goods. And not just don't do the wrong thing, but the school has to do the right thing by the supplier. And um, you could be the community that you're working in. And you could be student to student. So a big thing on campuses um, are when women get raped and nothing goes and happens. It gets pushed under the rug. Um, there was this big issue at Columbia University where the um, female student took a mattress out into the middle of the campus and, and pointed out that she was raped on this mattress because the school didn't do anything. She figured then the cameras and the news showed up and the news did show up and then they finally did something. There was a case at Stanford University, you know, the student went to a party, probably a fraternity party or something, had too much to drink. They found her behind a dumpster and she had been raped by one of the guys from the school. Um, and one of the issues came up with, that came up was also one of, of, of uh, equity because there was a similar um, case in the, southern, in, in, the, in the East Coast where the student was put in jail for many years. And the white student, the judge came up and said, well, he's learned his lesson. Well, not only um, was this brought up in the media and it was um, shown to be um, egregious uh, and the student was then forced to go to jail, but the judge was pulled down out off of his chair because he was treating the white male student differently than the black student in the east part of the United States. But the point of in code of conduct here is that there are steps that they will go through. And since the pandemic, we now have diversity, equity, and inclusion officers uh, in all the schools. Like that is their responsibility. It's their sole responsibility. Um, and so um, there are, even in the 13 years I've taught, changes that you know they go through this whole thing of investigation, um, and I have to go through Title IX and I forget the other one training every single year. Not only if somebody comes into the school shooting at you guys and we're in the class, the things that I'm supposed to do, which is very interesting because I'm not trained in it, but um, I will hurt somebody if they try to hurt my students. Um, that's just my moral side, <laughs> but um, but we're also trained in what we have to say, what we don't have to say. So someone can come to me um, and speak to me in a, um, what is it? Um, in a way that they know that I'm not gonna repeat what they say. Um, I have, I've had students who are on Make-A-Wish Foundation who are literally dying and it's nobody's business but hers or his and me. Um, I've had students who have mental disability or social or anxiety and they are given different um, ways to take testing, for instance. Nobody's business but them and me. But then I have situations where I find out one student was threatening to kill another student. And I'm absolutely required to carry that message forward, right? Um, same thing with plagiarism, et cetera, all that kind of stuff. So there are, there are now steps and rules that are ironed out, literally says, this is what you do. And if you don't do it, this is what happens, you know, et cetera. And these are code of conducts. So not just in business, but in schools. And I don't know about you guys, but when I was an undergrad, I actually had to sign an, an honor oath on every exam. I used to know it by heart because it, it was so long. I didn't know anyone else. I went to an engineering school, so I'm sure they had some military infusion there, but I had to sign an honor oath every single written exam. Yeah, we call, in the military, it's called a page 13. Okay, well, in the Navy. I, I had to it's sign, called a, I had to sign it's called, page 13. <laughs> well, yeah. Well, you worked on uh, for the DOD, right? Well, no, no. I well, I was. I, it was. I was trying to be funny, but it didn't work. I was oh. trying. I was trying to say that I had to do the same thing um, as the honor roll. But yeah, in the DOD, yeah. I also, as well as the fact that they took my watch, took my phone, took my camera, took everything because I was walking into classified um, and top secret environments. 
like in Jik mm -hmm. and in, in, in PACOM, the um, Pacific Command and uh, Pacific Intelligence. Um, yeah, I, I, I know exactly who you work for. Yeah. <laughs> so, all right, let's see. Um, code of ethics. We saw the triangle. We, I talked to Grayson. I talked about the environment, the three, uh, three Ps. And I talked about social. So the last one is, um, so can somebody tell me what consumerism is? And, and then if you can tell me in what way is consumer, can consumerism be bad? Um, and can you guys turn on your images and pictures? Cause I'm going to take the, um, I'm going to take the attendance picture. Is it protection or promotion of the interests of customers? Amber, so you said the did you say promotion? I didn't quite understand what you said. Like the protection or promotion of the interests of customers. Okay, so you're about consumerism, right? Right. Okay, so if you're a store or a company, are you saying that consumerism is our is our the actions and decisions we take to actually when you say production, produce what are you saying produce the product? The production, protection of the interests of the customers. Are you saying production? No, protection. Like to protect. Oh protection. Sorry, sorry. Yeah. No um, worries. Protection of consumers. Um the consumer no, protection so of the interests. Sorry for interrupting. Of right. the interests of the consumers. I mean right. Basically, yes, but. So, so I think you're talking about the Consumer Bill of Rights. That was just an exact definition of it. Can you look at it? Say it, No, I was just saying that's just like the textbook definition of it. Right. So, so when you think of consumerism, you if may believe you own a company. Well, okay, so I'm trying to, I'm going to explain something, but I'm giving away the answer and I'm trying to figure out how to explain without giving it away. Um, and I'm, I'm losing this fight. So, um, so, so almost 80% of GDP of the United States is through consumerism. I wrote that already down. So you already see that. And what that yeah. means is that majority of, and GDP, which is gross domestic product, it, it used to be called GNP many, like a hundred years ago, gross national product, but it's called gross domestic product. Um, is the dollar value applied to anything produced within the U.S. on um, the, and that includes our um, protectorates, our 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 um, islands like Saipan, Guam, Puerto Rico, etc. So anything within the domain of the United States is produced, and that includes, for instance, BMW producing M6s in South Carolina because it's done within the U.S. That's counted. So of that, and I and I shared after the chapter one class or a week ago or something like that, the um, the debt clock, and it shows how much money, not only we are in debt, but how much we've made. I forget if it's 24, 27 trillion, we're number one in the world. That's the dollar value of all that. 80% of that is through consumerism. And more and more capitalist nations are actually moving that direction. What that means is yeah. that when you order something through Uber Eats, when you take a ride in an Uber, when you um, go to a restaurant, get your hair done, go to a movie, go to a theater, go on a vacation, go on a trip, go to Vegas, go to a casino. All of these things that are that you can purchase, whether they're your food, clothes, phones, computers, goods, services, and ideas, you are consuming this, right? Yeah. If I'm a mattress company and I sell mattresses to Marriott Hotel, and then Marriott Hotel then rents out that room, Marriott bought the mattress. They are not consumers, they are customers. But when they mm -hmm. sold, they rented the room that included the bed with the mattress and the TV and the desk and all that. When you went that's and stayed in that hotel, you are the consumer. So that's why there is a difference between customers and consumers. But the majority of the U.S. Um, pro uh, productivity, and, and this is to Cami and Amber's point, you are creating something in the interest of the consumer, not only just to protect, but that they're interested at all, Right. And then, so, so consumerism um, is the way our economy works right now because so much of it is created through the consumption of those you and me who are actually buying and consuming goods, products, services, ideas, things like that. 
and, and to like keep on consuming. And keep on consuming, right? Okay. And that's where the issue starts to pop up. Because if you go back to, um, and, and guys, can you turn on your images because we're over time and I don't want to lose the attendance. So if you can turn on your videos and images and stuff like that, and my class, oh, John's already ready. And my class today is sponsored by, because I need to get a new one, my shaving cream, my, my shaver, um, the cleaner for my shaver. Oh, okay. I, I have I use straight edge and electric, and so I'm now out, and I need to get some more so I can make my blade sharp again. Let's see, Marjorie's using Martin. What is that? Is that a piece of chocolate? I don't know what that is. It's castor oil. Okay, is that castor oil? Yeah. <laughs> oh man, that is priceless. And Anna has. Is that your charger? Yeah. Cool. And Adiana, I don't know, you looks like you got a notebook. Ryan brought the brick wall again. Giselle brought, is that hair gel? No, it's a candle. Oh, it's a candle. I can smell it. It smells very nice. And Jaquan, my God, man, you words cannot express. I used to wear it that way too. I'm surprised you have a pig. And Amber brought, is that barbecue sauce? Uh, no. So I'm at work. <laughs> And because I came by car today and I was like for the whole time with a laptop in the uh, class and now I came to work, I'm in the private room. Uh, this is our homemade steak sauce. Oh, wow. So yeah. I right. said that everybody gets steak sauce. He's like Oprah Winfrey, you get steak sauce. <laughs> yeah. Tammy, Tammy brought Dove. I'm gonna think that's under on deodorant. And Anthony brought a tennis ball. He's still like, going through um, cold turkey after the uh, U.S. Open, I'm thinking. And because people live the longest, did you hear this? That people live the longest who play tennis? I don't know if you guys heard that, but that's only. And then see, Ginny brought a mug with, are those two eyes? What's on that mug? Oh, it's like a little bare face. Bare face. Oh, Nicole is giving Jaquan competition. <laughs> and Harlan brought a I think that's a phone. And Miracle brought some water. What about you, Quinn, Yami, Matthew, and Anita, and Brian? Yeah. All right, I'm going to set up the, uh, oh, and Adriana is not on the subway today. I remember. All right, oh, so let me set up. My question in the chat? I'm sorry, Professor. What's up? Oh, so it's community. Oh, I'm going to answer it. I just didn't want to, in case, because okay. I think there's okay. a couple of you that say, I got to run. So I want to get the attendance, and then I'll answer those questions. All right. Here we go. Okay, I'm ready. Everybody ready? Images ready? On three, get ready, get ready, get ready. Thank you, Brian. Thank you, Anita, with your bottle of water. Yami, where are you? Quinn, I always see your face in here. Matthew, where are you? One, two, oh, Cammy. oh, I see. One, two, three. Got it. Okay, let me make sure I got the picture, and then I'll answer these questions. Um... Hang tight, hang tight, hang tight, hang tight. Let me this. Um, tenants. Oh, you guys can actually see what I do when I do this. Because the last time it wouldn't copy. So this time. Um, done. Perfect. Come on, go. Perfect. All right. So, um, all right. So I'll answer the last of your questions. So, um. I think it was you, Cammy, who asked. Um, yeah, it was me. Consumers and buying without. The, by the way, Cammy, do you appreciate the fact that I played those videos at the beginning? Because I was thinking about you. Wasn't it you who said I can't? I can't just walk past something. Somebody in the class, something I can't just. Yeah, that was me. Yeah. See, see. So it's consumers and buying without the intention to make more money. No, the whole idea is to make money. And the, and the downside is that there's this thing called obsolescence. So if we go back to um, pre-industrial revolution, we were an agro-based society, meaning that you like you had cows, I made corn, and we started bartering, then we used the gold standard, then we had some form of paper money. And then the Civil War wasn't really fought over the, um, the freedom of, of, um, of, um, of Black people who were um, held in, in bondage and slavery. It was because the North decided they were going to industrialize the nation. The South was very happy using free labor. And so we couldn't be two nations. And so they had to fight in the 
and the industrial economy won, and then and in turn, um, they you know they there was no need for uh, slaves, and of course there was still Jim Crow and all these problems that happened. But um, but when we switched over, um, um, and this is you know after um, the the Civil War, right? We we then um, slowly became industrialized and more automated, and um, we could produce things faster. And so in the 1950s, there was a guy named um, McCormick who was in the farming industry. So if you ever go to Chicago and you go to the McCormick Center, that's named after him. And so um, people would buy things that were new and different. And then when they bought so much of it, there was no more left. So then they decided to advertise and sell harder. And as they, um, thank you for, you're welcome, Martin. So, so they started to buy, um, the companies couldn't sell anymore, so they started pushing harder to get people to buy more and more. And then marketing came about that said, well, let's figure out what people want and sell them that. And then they realized, well, people already have it. So if you talk to your grandparents, for instance, you know, they would buy things and say things would last a lifetime. And now things break down. That's called planned obsolescence. If you go to Apple, um, those of you who own phones and computers and stuff, they are... Uh, planning, they are um, counting on you getting rid of those phones every two years so that you buy another thousand dollar phone. And Didn't they get like a lawsuit for, um, they showed that the update was like slowing people's phones down intentionally so they could buy more. That, I don't know who it was, but. It's the battery. And so that's a little different. So in a way, it's one thing to plan obsolescence in that whatever you're using is not going to be supported going forward or doesn't support innovation going forward. It's another thing to, to, to um, compromise the function of a, of a device by making it so that it starts to break down. That that's a the new chargers too. They're not compatible with the old that, model. Well, that's not a problem because there was even a time when they had headphones and then they got rid of them because they wanted people to use the more expensive new um, hands-free headphones. And, yeah. and you know they pointed out all the benefits, and that's fine. It's nothing wrong with making changes. It's different if you break something, if you intentionally do something to cause it to stop working, right? So they're they're planning. The idea you can understand this is really straightforward. If you have if the product is not supported anymore or it doesn't support the new things going forward, then you have to buy a new one. In other words, you have to consume a new one, and that's called plan obsolescence. Um, if you own a computer with um, Microsoft or Office on it, what you'll find is that um, uh, the operating systems are always changing. And so there was Millennium, there was NT, et cetera. And so what Microsoft would say is, in two years, we're not going to support it anymore. So if you still have it, and a number of banks still had it, um, they, had to move, they had to move forward into the next operating system. Uh, from their standpoint, and I know tech, they would say, look, we have people that we pay two, three hundred thousand dollars a year to support the software, keep it running and to support customers on, on this. Meanwhile, we're having to now hire another bunch to support the newer one. So we don't want to support the old one. So that's so they were required to say you have to give customers fair warning. So they would give a two year warning and say in two years, we are no longer going to support this in a year, in six months. And then, boom, they stop supporting it. Right. So that's a little different in terms of plan obsolescence because they were running into incredible costs. And the only way they could um, account for that would be to raise the price by double on the software they're selling, right? So in some cases, it's necessary. In some cases, it's just to make more money, um, right? And so, and, and, and to the point Cammy's bringing up, that's a little different. They're, they're forcing obsolescence by breaking the product. That's illegal. You can't just break the product, right? You can improve it, you can change it, you can evolve it, you can encourage people to move on, like from plugged in headphones to hands-free headphones. And now of course you've got headphones that for athletes, some that you can swim with, some that, you know, they got all kinds of things like that. And that's just to try to figure out how to make more money um, with different types of consumers, right? So that's consumerism, and that's the plus and the negative of it, right? We as a nation thrive on consumerism as, as an economy, but there's also 
some negative effects of it uh, that you you should be um, wary of. All right, so we didn't go to the first two, and so I will look at what you guys wrote on discussion board for it. But um, I will ask, uh, I point out a couple of things, ask a couple of questions. Utilitarianism, right? So I mentioned this in the last class. Utilitarianism comes from utilities of satisfaction, which comes from Maslow. And the idea is that you want to maximize this. And the point is that one should suffer, that many should gain. And I mentioned triage in a hospital, and you see this in uh, military, but this is also shows up in business. You know, in other words, you spend money on trying to maximize the most output, even if it means you have to um, spend a little on one thing, but more on another. Consequentialism is, has more to do with the law. It's a bang bang effect. If something happens and you do what you can to avoid the problem, and then you notice on the video, the case of um, the, um, the second part with the boat, where um, the three people were at sea, the same thing happened in on Donner Lake and um, named after the Donna party in California. And the same thing happened with the guys who flew the plane into um, the South American Andes, the soccer team. Um, they were in, in Donner, in the case of the Donner and um, the Andes, um, the planes, the, the, the stagecoach crashed into a snowstorm in California and the plane crashed into um, the Andes in South America. And, and they were dying. And so they were forced to eat one another. They cannibalized. Yeah, they made a movie. And so the, the issue then becomes one of ethics because is it right or wrong? Well, you should never eat a person. Um, there are laws against cannibalism. But in this case, it wasn't one of utilitarianism where you were doing something so everybody could benefit. This was a case of consequentialism, bang, bang. In other words, you ran out of choices and so in the case of the group, the, the guys at sea, which was maritime law, um, your space, John, and then also in yep. the case of South America, which is similar because the air is actually a fluid, um, they crashed. And then in the case of Donald um, Lake, they were all found not guilty because um, they, were, they were put into a situation where they didn't have a lot of choices, right? And so that's where this pops up in business as well. Are you doing something um, to benefit many or are you doing something to benefit yourself only? Uh, and we have laws against that, like inside of trading. Um, and we talked about individual social and um, opportunity. Um, or are you in a situation where you just reacted to the circumstance, um, but you didn't have an agenda? That's why we have first degree and second degree murder, right? Um, and then the... Um, uh, what was the other one? There was, oh, Enron. And I'll read what you guys wrote because that's that'll take a while to go through. Um, um, when when do you want the uh, Enron stuff in there? Um, well, I'd like to get that done ASAP, right? Because uh, I okay. need to read it. So um, I'm going to open up homework two tonight. And uh, if you could get this done uh, in the next couple of days, I would like to get the Enron and Harvard stuff done on discussion board. Um, okay, I did the first one. Um, it was like, you know, with the five people, uh, you run them over on the train or you turn off and you kill the one. I did that question. Was there another question? I, like the, uh, it wasn't clear. Right, there's two parts of that video. If you notice, um, and, and that's, I actually watched the entire series. I mean, if you're into that kind of thing. No, the guy's very interesting. Very, he's the number one guy in the world when it comes to philosophy, philosophy um, Michael Sandel. Um, there's the, so in each the video there's class one and class two and so he's running two he each video has two classes and the okay. second one gets into the case of maritime law where um, the boat is going towards South America and that they, case for cannibalism yeah 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 exactly so those are only two in that one um, the Enron is the other one um, so if you guys I, I, I will write out uh, a due date on announcement but I need to get that done so that we can move on to chapter three next week. And I also need to tell you all about your project because when we leave chapter three, you're not gonna go into finance and accounting and that's, you're gonna need that for the case, for the um, project that you're doing. So um, sure. try not to fall behind, try to get everything done ASAP um, as quickly as possible so that, because your work's gonna become a little heavier, you're gonna see that I'm gonna pull back on some of the homework stuff because you're gonna have to put more effort into the, project stuff. Sounds good.
So any other questions in the class? If anybody needs to talk to me, I'll hang tight. I was looking for someone's name. I don't see it. All right. I don't see it. Anyway, um, thanks a lot for everyone. If you need to talk to me, I'll hang on. Uh, all the best. Enjoy the rest Hi, of the professor. All right. Bye, Take professor. Have a good one, guys. All right. Bye, bye. guys. Quinn, Yami, and Matthew. Quinn, Yami, do you have questions? Going once, going twice. All right, we're done.